Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I am the same guy you've seen every other week you've watched these videos. So, you know, Nicholas Tyson, that's the guy right here. Whatever. So today we're going to be talking about two super fun. Oh, it's my cat. If you hear meowing in the background, that's my cat. Apologies. <laughs> um, so this week we're going to be talking about um, Fujiwara no Teika, the poet, scholar, and all-around great guy. I don't know. <laughs> um, and actually, then one of my favorite um, authors from the Kamakura period, uh, Lady Nijol and her Toazu Gatari. So as per usual, let's get into our, our sherry bit. All right. So that's not what I wanted to start with. That's what I wanted to start, <laughs> start with. Okay. Let's move me out of the way. I'm gonna move me down so I can do that. All right. It's different for you guys um, on my screen. I'm right here. Anyway, so we got this guy. Uh, so it's kind of, it's not entirely clear how his name is supposed to be read. Um, Fujiwara no Teika is how it's typically read, although sometimes it's read um, Sadaie. Those are just two different pronunciations of the same kanji characters. So, you know, either way, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Teika because that's how he's commonly referred to. Um, Born near the end of the Heian period and sort of grew up in the those that that 30 year period of like constant decline and warfare when everything was kind of falling apart. So Teika is an interesting dude. Um, he was a poet, scholar, crafts like he was just a general all around like he studied everything. Um, so that's why I have he's a sort of general polymath. So you probably recognize this name right here, Fujiwara. He is not a powerful or particularly like um, important. He's important because of what he did. He's not important because of being a member of the Fujiwara clan. He was actually born to a much less powerful and less notable branch of the Fujiwara clan. Although, it, as I noted, um, this is the period in which their fortunes were sort of steadily on the decline. And that was taking place throughout Teika's life. He's mostly known as a poetic innovator. But what's interesting about his innovation is that his aesthetic is an extremely like studied one. His whole point is that you're supposed to like study older poets from the past. You're supposed to study the best poets from the past and take from them that which you will use in your new or more innovative forms of po you know your poems that are sort of this this in this new style. So the the newness is something about it's like making the old new again. And like I said, it's very much a kind of it's a it's a style that is for and of people who are really nerds. It's nerd poetry, basically. <laughs> and that's one of the things that, this is a trajectory that we're going to see throughout this course that um, poetry is just going to keep getting nerdier. It's going to keep getting more and more and more about being sort of going to be a more abstruse. It's going to get more studied. It's going to be more about like, oh, do you recognize how I alluded to this particular poet from the past? That's just going to get worse. Um, he was one of the four editors of the, the Shin Kokinshu. Now this, you probably recognize part of that, that term. Um, the Shin part just means new. Um, and the Kokinshu is the, the famous imperial anthology that we read in the previous unit. Um, yeah, so you, you see this, he, he's clearly like modeling his own like scholarly slash aesthetic practice on these these much older materials and so the idea is that you're so in creating a new kokinshu it's sort of like reinvigorating what was best about the past and bringing it into the present um he is also responsible for selecting the poems that became the ogura hyakuni ishu um you guys may be familiar with this there the so there's a there's a type of karuta there's a type of like card game that involves the hyakuni ishu it's a selection of like 100 canonical it's like one like um, emblematic poem each from a hundred of like, you know, the best poets of the past. And the Hyakunin issue is taken as the sort of like exemplar of what Tonka, what Waka is supposed to be. Now I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through um, Teika because I'm mostly going to be talking about him as a sort of like introduction to talking about Nijol. But I have a bunch of aesthetic concepts here that you're probably going to want to learn. Some of them I'm only going to just briefly allude to, but some I'll come back to. 
So one of the things that uh, Teika is most known for is coining this term, honkadori, which literally means like to, to, to take from an original poem. So we have like, you know, original oops why did that moved uh, move back over here there we go <laughs> and then the toady here to, to take or to grab um, it's usually translated into english as elusive variation and what it literally refers to is um you you take a phrase one of those coup one of those like either five or seven syllable phrases from you know an earlier famous or maybe even less famous like if you want to be really coy you can take one that's sort of sort of famous maybe not as well known but the idea is that you take part of that poem and you literally just reinsert it into your own and then you build a new poem around it so you can see this is how like um take as aesthetic plays out this idea of like literally you take something for, like from the best you take from the best of the past and then you build your new poem your new literary work of art around it. Um, and to this end, he is known for this dictum right here. Kotoba furuku kokoro atarash. So uh, literally old words, new meanings. And he means that quite literally, like you literally take those old words and through the process of like reinvention, give them new meanings. And oh, actually, yeah, let's take a look at there's so there's this bit in so I excerpted a little bit for you guys to read today. You don't have to read all of this. Um, I just wanted you to have it so that way you can refer to it. So there's this treatise that he wrote called The Essentials of Poetic Composition, the Ega no Taigai. And in it, so this is the the the, the opening bit. This is the the introduction. And actually, no, I'll come I'll come back to this in a second. Oh yeah, because I talk about it here. Sorry, guys, <laughs> just getting ahead of myself. OK, so um, another important aesthetic concept for Teika is this, this idea of truth, literally, makoto. Um, usually, this is translated as like integrity. Um, it refers to the sort of like the completeness or like the poem, everything about a poem functioning towards one end or towards one goal the idea that like all the different elements like the 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 imagery the words you use the the, the style the appearance etc 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 all that is supposed to be directed towards one purpose and that is its truth that is its integrity towards makoto um, another important concept we have that comes from Teika is this notion of ushin actually it doesn't really come from Teika now that i think about it but he emphasizes it I guess is what I should say. Um, Ushin, this is related to um, a concept that we will be talking about in relationship to um, theater in the next unit. So there, there, there's this classic dichotomy, Ushin, Mushin. So literally, so the Ushin is like having, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you have feeling. Wait, is that the right character? That's not the right character. Should be that one. I don't know what happened there. I thought I had selected that one. There we go. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Otherwise, it was the right heart, like the right the right hand side of your heart. No, that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be um the it's supposed to be having, possessing, so possessing heart or having feeling. Um, this refers to sort of like a depth of feeling, like a sort of profundity. The idea is that when you read a poem, it's not just about sort of like recognizing the the technical skill of the the author in question, but that it's supposed to affect you. It's, you're supposed to you're supposed to react in an emotional way. You're supposed to have an um an em there's supposed to be a kind of sensation that you have as a result of reading the poem that's deeply effective, and that's affective in this sense, meaning like affect you know your emotions, your feelings. Okay, the other thing that uh, Teika is really known for is this sort of tripartite aesthetic that, okay, now turning to that bit <laughs> at the beginning of the, the Ega no Taikai, Taikai, sorry. Um, he says, as for the meaning, which is the, the kokoro, so now actually let me go through these, these terms real, real quick. So you have the, the kokoro, which is literally the heart, although this is translated here as meaning and that's not necessarily inappropriate because um the heart here is sort of like the heart in the sense of like the core or the essence like you know when we say like to get to the heart of the matter that doesn't literally mean like 
the blood pumping organ of the matter. It means sort of the, the essence or like the meaning, the essential part. Um, kotoba, which is pretty straightforward, just refers to the words. Like so, so you have the, the 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 essential meaning. You have the words you use, and then you have the fute. Fute he, um, is translated here as style. Um, it literally means like appearance, and appearance in the sense of like putting on clothes. So the the kokoro, so the heart is the like the essential meaning. The words are the words <laughs> and then the, the fute the appearance is sort of like this the style is like the the dressing is the robe you put on to sort of like decorate and make the whole thing prettified and so Teika elaborates on this in his introduction he says as for the meaning the kokoro of poetry newness newness must come first one must seek a conception or an approach that has yet to be used in other words when drawing from these things from the past, you don't just want to repeat it. That's boring. Like you don't want to just do what that poet did over again. You want to have a new idea, something brand new, a, a new conception that you want to get across that you're going to use that, that, that older stuff to, to achieve. When it comes to diction, he says, which is diction here is kotoba, so words, one must use old words. Okay, <laughs> like it's not just like one must use those old-fashioned words. The whole point is that you you must draw from the pre-existing sort of like poetic language. Don't invent it yourself. Like take from what precedes you. Take from what already exists and make it new. One must not use anything not found in the three collections. And the three collections he's referring to are the um, the Kokenshu, uh, the Goshushu, and um, one other Heian, one that I can't remember off the top of my head, maybe the introduction to this. Oh, the Gosenshu and the Shuishu. Okay. Sorry. The poems of so these are the these are the oldest of the Heian Imperial anthologies. Interestingly enough, he does not say like the Manyol Shu. Because for him, for Teika, like the the Manyol Jidai is like that's too old. There's sort of like a sweet spot oldness. There, there is a. I mean, really, he's talking about sort of like high Heian culture. In other words, the literary works of for, for what for people in the Kamakura period would have been like, essentially, they're modernists. I mean, I know that probably sounds a little strange, but it would have been you know literature that for them would have been you know at least a hundred and a couple hundred years old, maybe not even modernist. So like from our perspective, they'd be like, you can only refer to literature from like Shakespeare to the restoration. So <laughs> this is a little, a little strange, but that's what, that's what he's saying. I mean, that's his thing. The style, again, the futes so the clothes, the robes, if you will, of poetry can be learned from the superior poems of superior poets of the past. In other words, don't just go look into anybody. Don't just find some rando in like some some anthology that you found or some poem you heard from way back when. The whole point is that you're supposed to be again, this sort of speaks to take a scholarly or studied attitude. You're supposed to be able to recognize what is better in the past and draw from that. You go for the better poets and then from the better poets you take the better poems. Those are the things that you're supposed to draw from. And he caps this with, one should not be concerned about the period, but just learn from appropriate poems. Now, this is kind of weird. So what's interesting here is that he sort of posits that the, the poems themselves have a kind of essence that is to be learned from. In other words, the whole thing that I'm trying to teach you guys to do, to think about literature in like historiographic terms or to like think about the period, you know, cultural trends and all of these, he's saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. What, he would hate this course. <laughs> this course, Teika would not approve of. He'd be like, no, don't do any of that. You can just read it. Just read the thing. It'll tell you what it is, which um, speaking as a literary scholar is kind of ridiculous <laughs> when you think about it. So so that's, that's Teika's deal. Um, now, what's interesting about this is think about what Teika is saying in relationship to, say, like, the poetry test in um, the pillow book. So we, if you recall, um, the the empress that Seishonagon had been serving, she, she tells the story of um, a young woman who is being courted by the emperor. And the emperor tries to like pull one, pull one over on her by like 
seeing how many of the, the poems of the Kokin Shu she's memorized. And because she's really, because this woman is really, really, really into poetry, he can't pull one over on her. There, the sort of the appreciation and the reading of this earlier poetic anthology is not about sort of like, it's not an, it's not emblematic. It's not something you're supposed to draw from. It's not, it's just, it's just supposed to show your refinement as an individual. In other words, she is clearly a superior kind of woman because she knows the Kokinshu so well. That's not what Teika is doing here. It's not about you personally. This is more technical. You draw from poets of the Kokinshu because those are the best poets with the best poems. And you're supposed to be able to recognize like that, that whole world of sort of like using poetry as a kind of aesthetic practice that just doesn't exist for Teika. And so it's a very different kind of thing. Now, before moving on to um, Lady Nijol, I want to look at one of Teika's poems to sort of get a sense of like how this whole aesthetic thing works. Like, luckily for me, it's at the end <laughs> of what I have exerted for you. Okay, so it's number 38 from the, the Shinko Kinshu, this um, anthology that Teika and a couple of other dudes edited. And the poem goes a little something like this. For a 50 verse set of poems composed at the request of the cloistered prince Shukaku. Oh, geez. This thing only gave us one of them. Okay, it goes. A spring night's floating bridge of dreams breaks. Sky of cloud drift parting from a mountain peak. Hey, you know, I mean, for, for you guys who are sort of encountering, you know, this, this type of poetry for the first time, you're probably like, that just sounds like all those poems are read from the Kokinshu. And it's like, well, that's one, that's kind of the point. And Teika is, is trying to actually mimic that. But actually what I want to focus on is this line right here. Yume no ukihash, floating bridge of dreams, which is sort of an odd expression. And we didn't read this chapter of the Genji, but it is a chapter of the Genji. It's actually the very last chapter of the Genji has exactly this title. Now this is actually considered to be, so here we, we literally, so even though this isn't quite, it isn't exactly what I was saying earlier in terms of like Hongadori, the, like taking from, but it's still, it's the same basic idea. Like he's not taking from a poem, he's taking from, you know, the title of, um, one of the chapters of the Genji, but the whole point is that like you as a knowledgeable, as a studied, learned reader are supposed to recognize Teika's illusion. Now, thankfully you have me here to tell you <laughs> what Teika's illusion is. And it's to this, this final chapter of the Genji. Now, I don't, now, and, and here's what's interesting about it. Now, it might seem natural to then say like, okay, well, what happens in the last chapter of the Genji and like what, aspect of that is he alluding to but again take it doesn't actually want take out this not want you necessarily to do that like the whole point is that the expression itself has a kind of power to it and he's bringing it into this new poem like he isn't necessarily i mean take in this poem isn't necessarily interested in like genji's grandson which who is the sort of the protagonist of that chapter because it's after genji has died um and the whole like affair that he's involved in, like that doesn't necessarily play here. This is a much more sort of, there's a kind of melancholic tone to this. Haru no yo no so a spring nights, dreams, ukihashi, floating bridge. So the floating bridge of dreams on a spring night, todai shite, breaks or sort of is interrupted actually. So breaks, I mean, I mean, I guess the, the translator is trying to be poetic, but literally sort of the, the, the poem begins by sort of like putting you first in this kind of like ethereal world of like remembrance and reminiscence and like a kind of like ah, ah, moment, but then it snaps. It sort of suddenly is interrupted. And that is like, and so he's, and so then that image of, so that sort of like notion, that idea of a spring dream suddenly coming to an end, like a floating bridge, like sort of breaking apart. A pontoon bridge is like, so the ukihashi in this case is kind of like a pontoon bridge. So like the idea is that like the bridge itself is coming apart and it's no longer floating appropriately. He says that that is like sky of cloud drift parting from the mountain peak. I'm going to translate this a little bit better than this. So mine ni, so from, from the peak, from, so wakaruru mine, mine ni wakaruru, separating from or sp parting from a mountain peak. 
Yokogumo no Sora. So a, a sky full of so the 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 Yokogumo the these are horizontal clouds. I'll explain what this is in a sec. So these clouds. So so imagine this. You you've got like a mountain peak here, and there are like clouds here, and all the clouds are sort of like arrayed around the mountain peak. This is this is sort of a classic image in Japanese art. Like you know you have like Mount Fuji, and the horizontal clouds are sort of all arranged around its peak. And so he's saying that the dream snaps like those clouds suddenly splitting from each other and revealing the peak of this mountain. So. What's interesting about the poem is that there is a kind of melancholic tone here because this verb that he uses, wakaru, is also like it's parting, not just in the sense of like splitting, but also like sort of parting from a lover. So the implication is that suddenly, like, you know, there is the, and also the dream is itself an allusion to like in a romantic affair because there is this, this hang on notion of like people meeting on, you know, the, the so called bridge of dreams. And so the dream breaks, sort of the, the relationship is interrupted just like these clouds that suddenly split from the mountain peak. But what's interesting about that is that you suddenly see the peak in the moment that they split. In other words, they're sort of concealing it. And as they split, you see this thing revealed. It's a really sort of, it's a very difficult poem. And in fact, um, this poem is often commented upon by scholars as, as one of Teika's most difficult. But the image here is, it, it's one that you literally have to like study, that you have to sort of focus on, that you have to think about like all of the components of the images and then how that relates to the dream, the interruption of the dream being like the splitting clouds. But then what do you, like all of that stuff has to be part and dissected. It's not like a Heian po period poem where you're supposed to be kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. This poem is like, mm, it's, it's a very strokey beard kind of poem. It's like, mm, yes, yes, I figured this poem out. Because again, it's a, it's a scholarly type of poetry. Okay, now with all that junk in mind, let's turn to the person that I actually want to focus on today, which is um, Lady Nijol and her Toazugatari. So the title of this um, very long book, in fact, I have the book right here. <laughs> um, literally means um, a tale no one asked for. So the, the, the Gatari is the same as in Monogatari, a tale. Um, and the toazu here is a verb, actually. It means like did not ask for, d does, don't ask for. So literally a tale no one wanted, <laughs> a tale no one actually asked for. And that's an interesting way of like, I don't know, framing what this, what this thing is, is because it's, it's, very, it's a very personal tale because it's, it, it's autobiographical. Um, but also at the same time, there's a kind of sense to it that like, you know, what is, the, there's a feeling of fatalism to it as well. The title implies that there's a kind of like, you know, why does this thing even exist? It's a good question. <laughs> Lady, Lady, Lady Nijo attempts to answer that through the, the tale itself. So it's a sort of weird, it, it kind of, it's kind of a genre defying text because it's a literary autobiography similar to the sort of Heian period Nikki, those sort of like literary diaries, which I didn't actually have you read an example of, but too bad. <clears throat> but it's also very much like a monogatari in the sense of the tale of Genji or the, the tales of Ise. And in fact, I think it's actually more appropriate, even though it's autobiographical, even though it is kind of a diary. <laughs> in fact, it's usually translated. In fact, the your translation has it as the confession Let's see if I can get that up there. The Confessions of Lady Nijo. The word confession is never used in the title. That's not what she thinks it is. But it is much more like prose fiction, even though it purports to be true. It purports to be the, sort of the story of this woman's life from in a fairly narrow window her like of her adult life. Um, what's the, uh, sort of just interesting background information about the Toazu Gatari is that so it wasn't really known in um, either in the period in which it wasn't really that well known in which the period in the period it was written. And it certainly wasn't known that well known in following periods. Um, it comes from a single manuscript um, discovered in the Imperial Archives in 1940 by this dude, Yamagishi Tokuhei. And as I note here in 
sub item i <laughs> or sub item yeah one i guess that is but lowercase roman numeral one altogether unknown really until the modern era so this is sort of a, a recent discovery about of you know a, a writer from this period and so it's i don't know i don't know if that's interesting to you guys but it is something to keep in mind that like other writers like writers after her aren't really aware <laughs> of her existence this is sort of like a one-off thing but i think it's really cool so um i in your reading for this week um, i exerted for you um a bit from book one and also a bit from book four which is much 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 later in the text so at this point in nijo's life she's 14 years old um and her father has for some reason decided to take it upon himself to like attach his daughter romantically to the emperor of uh, Fukaksa. Um, now, Nijo's interests or um, desires are not factored in <laughs> to, to, to this at all. And so what makes this, um, especially this, this, this very bit in the very first book interesting is that you in essence see a kind of classical like romantic encounter entirely from the perspective of a woman now i tried to make the argument that the tale of genji is really sort of about the female characters but it very still very much takes a masculine perspective it sees those romantic encounters as the man would see them whereas here it's entirely from a woman's perspective now not only that but it also sort of gives us an opportunity to re-examine that moment when Genji first beds, perhaps rapes, um, Murasaki in, in chapter nine of the Genji, which you guys read, in that really sort of eerie moment, that complex, that really complicated moment where it's not entirely clear what you're supposed to make of it, even in its historical context. And certainly by in a modern context, it's gross and inappropriate and wrong. Um, so from Nijo's perspective, like that wrongness is foregrounded, like, whereas in the Genji, it's kind of hinted at that there's something untoward about Genji and Murasaki's relationship, especially the way in which Genji's like trying to raise Murasaki as like his daughter slash lover, it's just all sorts of messed up. Um, in this instance, like the wrongness is foregrounded. Like, it's pretty clear that it's wrong. It's pretty clear that Nijo sees it as inappropriate and she very clearly states that like she doesn't mince words it's not what she wants so if we take a look at page five let me scroll back up do, do, do. so she says near the top of the page here i don't know how long i had slept leaning against the brazier just inside the sliding door my outer gown thrown up over my head but I suddenly awakened to find the lights dim, the curtains lowered, and inside the sliding door right beside me, a man who had made himself comfortable and fallen fast asleep. What is this? I cried. No sooner did I get up to leave than his majesty wakened. Without rising, he began to tell me how he had loved me ever since I was a child. Again, echoes of Genji here. How he had been waiting until now when I was 14. Still gross. <laughs> and so many other things that I had not words enough to record them all but i was not listening i could only weep until even his sleep even his sleeves were dampened with my tears as he tried to comfort me he did not attempt to force me but he said you have been indifferent to me for so long that i thought on this occasion perhaps how can you continue to be so cold especially now that everyone knows about this so that's how it was this was not even a secret dream everyone knew not even a secret dream I mean, think back to that um, think back to the the takeout poem the sort of the like the dream interrupted here we see a different take on the dream interrupted this time it's um worse i don't know how else to say it everyone knew about it and no doubt as soon as i woke my troubles would begin my worries were sad proof that i had not completely lost my senses at least but i was wretched if this was what was in store for me, why hadn't I been told beforehand? And here, and I, I mean, this moment is crushing because it's like here we get inside the mind of a woman in this situ in these circumstances in a way that the Genji, the Genji always sort of like holds us just past 
the point of like being inside the head of, of of these these really i mean they're really interesting literary women but at the same time it doesn't actually put us inside their minds but but here since we have an autobiographical text we see inside her mind we see what she is thinking and it ain't good why hadn't i been told beforehand why didn't he give me a chance to discuss it with my father how could i face anyone now I moaned and wept so much that he must have thought me very childish, but I could not help myself, for his very presence caused me pain. That's it right there. And so, I don't know, for, so, so for me, as you know, for my position, like, you know, looking at, looking back at the Genji and it's sort of, it's obliqueness, it's vagueness. Here, I think we get the sort of, I mean, it's a, it's a different, I mean, obviously Mijo is a different person from Murasaki, but we sort of, we get what I feel like would be the woman's take in this situation. And it's not good. It's really bad, actually. And so the the encounter between Gof Gaksa and um, Nijo plays out very similarly to the way a, um, a romantic encounter plays out in the Genji, but what's interesting about it is that sort of the way in which this text sort of reinterprets that. In other words, by alluding to the Genji, she's not just doing what say, what Teika would do, sort of like this entirely new conception, like you take from the old to create an entirely new thing. Now here, she's actually reinterpreting that text. The point of the illusion is not just to sort of like use it because it's superior, it's a superior thing from a superior writer. The point of using it is to actually reread that text, to re-understand it. And so let's go back to the, the outline real quick. Uh, let's see, it's on page eight, where this sort of becomes So the, the encounter kind of plays out in sort of like this give and take. It's like, why, why are you being so cold? Like, again, she says that he doesn't force her, but at the same time, like, it, it's not like, the, it's not about the dude, like, literally physically compelling this woman. Like, the, the compulsion comes from the circumstances. It's the whole situation that she's put in that compels her to act against her own will. So then it says here on page eight, shortly after dusk fell, I was I was informed that his majesty had arrived. So the thing is you you see you see bits of this where like where she talks earlier about how like you know after I would wake up, like everyone knew about it already. So after I wake up, that's when my troubles would begin. The point is that it's it's pro, it's prob it's a problem for her, not because like she has conflicted feelings. It's a problem for her precisely because there are all these other people involved, all these other people who are compelling her to do things that she doesn't necessarily want to do. There is a kind of helplessness. There is a kind of fatalism. And it is that helplessness and fatalism that is indicative of the literature of this period. And we, you know, we saw that in the Hege Monogatari. We saw that sense of like, it doesn't matter how good of a person you are or what you do, like the world is going to screw you over. And here we see her being screwed over by the world around her. Sorry. Shortly after dusk fell, I was informed that his majesty had arrived. Before I had time to wonder what might happen at this meeting, he pushed open the door and entered my room with an air of intimacy. I understand you're ill. What's the trouble? He inquired. So, you know, he plays it, you know, sort of like the concerned lover. Feeling not the least inclination to reply, I lay motionless where I was. He lay down beside me and began to talk of what was uppermost in his heart. But I was so dazed that I could only worry about what would happen next. I was tempted to acquiesce, quoting the line, if this were a world without lies. Except for my fear that the person who had claimed he might die of grief would consider my behavior vulgar when he learned that the evening smoke had so quickly trailed off in a certain direction. So here we see her trying to play the the aesthetic game of being like you know that the, the classic like Heian era woman like the the lover who knows the right literary references but that is put up against the fact that at the same time she can't come to grips 
like emotionally with what is happening to her. In other words, the the sort of like the aesthetic posture that she is like an aristocratic woman is expected to adopt is at odds with the um with her own feelings with her like personal stake in what's going on so nijo is not just as i noted she's not just using the old in the new in accordance with like take us aesthetic but in a sense she is rereading the genji in line with a very different world in other words the i so this is sort of, so here's the here's the here's the sort of moral calculus here like what happens to murasaki with genji in the tale of the Gen, in in the genji monogatari is a function of and has to be understood in terms of like the sort of like court life of that particular world but as i discussed last week sort of the world the society of the kamakura period is fundamentally a transformed one in other words, it's aware of what life was like back in the Heian period, but it isn't like that anymore. So what we see here in Nijo's writing is she's taking that same kind of moment, the sort of like the classic Heian romantic encounter, but seeing what happens when you transpose it into this new world with this new perspective. Now, and so what we see as a result of this rereading, sort of this reinterpretation, like seeing the Genji through the lens of Nijo's Toazugatari, the Genji sort of comes out in a different light because it sort of, it makes clear that like, what is only ever hinted at in the Genji, this idea that like, what happens to women is the function of like other people's machinations like that's explicit in this text and so the point is not just it's not just that nijo is making that point about this world but also that you can then take that observation and you can go back and you can look at the genji and you can see it there as well so in the same way that the world of like the Han court and it's sort of leisurely i like that in the same way that that all of that has been transformed what nijo is trying to show you is also the understanding of the literature of that world of that period has also been transformed and i mean if, if it hasn't been obvious already <laughs> i mean I, i'll just make it explicit like you can very clearly compare this to what we saw in in honen's writing this idea that like we are all to a certain degree broken and we're not and we're broken because of the historical circumstances we find ourselves in there's nothing we can do about it again it's that sense of fatalism that pervades the text whereas that kind of fatalism isn't really there in the genji it's just not even in it even in its like in its hairiest moments even in it's in its sort of uh, its most difficult moments that sense of like a world falling apart just isn't there but it is here and what's interesting is that in it being here in this text you can almost sort of go back and see at least the precursor of that fallen world there as well all right so i want to skip way 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 so the the other bit that i had you got that i'm having you guys read for this week comes from book four so at this point in the text um nijo is no longer living in the capital and in fact as book when book four begins she has abruptly become a, she's now a nun <laughs> and she has decided to to leave the capital because everything about it has just sort of rubbed her the wrong way and it's just it's been a completely miserable experience for most of her adult life and so as she moves forward what's interesting is so like okay so if that bit that we saw in um from book one is a clear rereading of um the the tale of genji what we're seeing here in book four is more rereading of the the tales of isa because it begins with her deciding to sort of take this journey eastward from the capital and it's sort of a similar eastward movement that we see similar to the eastward movement that we see in um, episode nine of the the tales of isa when the man the otoko who is ariwana no narihira 
um, decides to sort of travel to the east. And it's kind of a melancholy journey because, you know, you're moving away from the capital where all the things, all the cool stuff is happening. Um, Nigel's journey to the east as a nun is also also has a sort of melancholic tenor to it, but it's it's a little different. Actually, it's a lot different. So as she's traveling east, this is, uh, I'm just gonna, so here on page 183, I want to look at, I want to look just briefly at this section right here. It's, it's, it's actually really short. She says, at the place known as Eight Bridges, finding that the bridges were gone and the rivers dried up, I felt as though I'd lost a friend. And she writes this poem. The web of my trouble still streams out in all directions yet not a trace remains of the eight bridges. So this is a pretty clear illusion. I mean, it's not, it's probably the, one of the more <laughs> obvious illusions in the um, entire Tawazu Gatari. And so, ah, sorry, this is annoying because like the, there. So it's an allusion to this, um, episode nine from the Isi Monogatari, which I had you guys read before, but just as a refresher, I'll go back through it. Real quick, it says, in the past, there was a man having made up his mind that his position was worthless. And now now think of, okay, now this is important. So now think about Nijo's position and how she would perceive this. Having made it, so, and maybe actually let's change the pronouns a little bit. In the past or in the present, there is a woman Having made up her mind that her position was worthless, she thought that she should live in the east rather than in the capital, and she set out to find a province where she could reside. She went with an old friend or two. Since none of them knew the way, they wandered about. They arrived at a place called Eight Bridges in Mikawa province. The place is called Eight Bridges because the rivers in which the water flows branch like a spider's legs. A spider's legs. Remember what she says? Her web of troubles. and were spanned by eight bridges. They dismounted in the shade of a tree at the edge of the marsh there and ate dried rice. In the marsh, irises were blooming beautifully. Seeing them, one of the parties said, compose upon some. This is the, the famous poem from this section. So the the allusion to sort of the, the, the rivers like splayed out like spiders' legs and then, you know, the bridges crossing them. And then her poem that she writes, when she says her web of troubles, also an allusion to sort of like the spiderly nature of the rivers. But what's interesting here is that sort of the the poetic topos, the, the sort of like this image of like, you know, irises growing in, you know, sort of like the marshy waters of these eight rivers and these bridges that span them. Here she says it's all gone. At the place known as Eight Bridges, Yatsuhashi is what it's called, finding that the bridges were gone and the rivers dried up, I felt as though I had lost a friend. So here, what, like, it's hard to even know where to begin with this. So what she's saying is that, like, so she goes to this place. And the implication is that when she reaches this famous location, from this famous work of literature that there's going to be sort of like a, a kind of repetition. She's going to experience perhaps what Narihira experienced, you know, when he saw this and was asked to write this, this acrostic poem. And she gets there, but it's all changed. It's the, the place itself is gone. It is a fallen location, if you will. It, it sort of disappeared. And so she has this connection to this literary text that she wants to sort of like import into her life and in her experience of this moment. But because it's gone, her connection to that past is similarly broken. And she says, I felt as though I had lost a friend. Because for her, the connection to the past is not just a matter of like, you know, your technical skill of like, I recognize the superior poet and I, I understand which of their poems are the best and I'll pick the best phrases from the best poems of the best poet and then I'll use it in my own and I'll show how smart I am as this like poet scholar, et cetera, et cetera. 
That's not what she's doing here. For her, it's something that she feels deeply. In other words, this is a much better expression of that concept of ushing, that sort of like that profundity of feeling than anything Taika writes, to be perfectly honest. Because And so when that connection to the literary past is gone, when that connection to the literary past is broken because she arrives there only to see that all that stuff is just not there anymore, for her, it's a cause for mourning. And not just like a generic cause for mourning, it's a cause, like for her, the the sort of the literary text, the literary illusion is something that is very close to her, to her heart. And then to go there and to try and experience that thing that she's kept so close and to see that it's not there, it's like an old friend has died for her because it just, she can't reclaim that connection. And I got, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little maudlin about this, but that's what's going on in her mind as she takes this journey. She she goes and she try, she wants to see all of these famous literary things that she knows from these famous literary texts. And she's going to go and have the same profound experience that all these writers themselves had, but that world just doesn't exist anymore. But <laughs> what's interesting is though, the world that Nigel paints in her text is much fuller. Like there are, there are many, there are many more, there's many more different kinds of people in this world. Like there's, there's prostitutes and there's nuns and there's people picking cherries. And then, you know, there are these two entertainers. There's the, there's the two sisters, one who plays the Koro, the other plays the Biwa. And she has this little conversation with them. There's the, the dancers at the shrine. Like she runs into all different kinds of people. And what's interesting is that these are all different kinds of people that we didn't see in those, those Heian period texts. This world has so many different kinds of people in it. And so even though it's a fallen world, even though it's broken in some sense, even though sort of the eye of wisdom is not available to us anymore, as Honen would say, um, it's much richer, like it's, it's livelier. And so there's this, this perversity of how even in a world that's falling apart, there's a, there's a kind of like, how should I put this? Like Nigel's fatalism isn't dire in the way the sort of you see the fatalism of like a text like the the tales of the heka for her strangely enough her fatalism feels more like and this and this is something that i note down here her fatalism actually feels much more like that melancholic attitude that you saw in Heian period writers and so strangely perhaps ironically she kind of recaptures she sort of makes new that aesthetic sense in a world that is unlike the one that it originally came from. And I think that that sort of, and so this is what I want to close with for, for today and for this week. Um, you see that captured beautifully in this moment at the end of, by the way, these chapter divisions are the invention of the translator. Then only the book divisions exist in the original text. So what she has at the end of chapter 19, you see this moment, this encounter between um, Nijol and this um, mountain ascetic at the, as it says, Senju Grotto. She says, uh, the ascetic, made, so this is the bottom of 185. The ascetic made me feel welcome and presented me with some shells of the area, whereupon I opened the basket of my, my companion carried, took out a fan from the capital and offered it to him. Living here as I do, I never hear news from the capital, he said. Certainly, things like this aren't brought to me by the wind. Tonight, I feel as though I've met a friend from the distant past. My own feelings quite agreed. And so this is sort of like the, this is the, this is the return to that same problem. So the problem is introduced in trying back here with the sort of the, the web of troubles and sort of like the fact that like this connection to like the literary past is broken. But then that idea is capped here in this encounter with the, the mountain ascetic who feels like in this encounter between people. And that's the important distinction being made here. Whereas the, the broken connection is in terms of like her connection to the literary past. That connection is felt again in the relationship between individuals in this moment, in the here and now. 
She says, it was quiet when no one ar- with no one around and no special event taking place, yet I could not sleep a wink that night. And further down, um, she keeps talking about how like she's unsuited to travel and like I felt like I, <laughs> my, my legs kept giving out. Um, so near the, the end of that page, 186, um, I felt as though I had actually journeyed 2000 Li. Li is like a, it's like a league. It's like a mile and a half. It's, it's a weird measure of distance. From the hills behind the grotto, I heard the heart-rending cries of monkeys and felt an anguish so intense it seemed new. The newness there. I had undertaken the solitary journey with only my thoughts and my grief in hopes that it would dry my tears. How distressing to have come so far and yet to have the worries of the world still cling to me. Again, that, no, that, that sort of fatalism, that idea that you can't escape, that it's always going to be with you, the brokenness of the world will stick with you wherever you go. And she caps it with this poem. And I really actually, this is not a great translation of this poem, but it, it still actually gets across what I think is really great about it. A roof of cedar branches, pine pillars, bamboo blinds. If only these could screen me from this world of sorrow. So let's think about this for a second. And, it, and it's an allusion back to how she describes the grotto. She says, um, <sighs> Senju Grotto, as it was called, was a humble yet charming dwelling with fog for a fence and bamboo trees for screens. In other words, it is a natural place. It is a place that is so impoverished that it doesn't even have a fence except for the fog. And it doesn't have like beautiful screens, just has the trees. And so she alludes to this in her final poem, where she says, a roof of cedar branches. So the, the branches of the cedar trees create a roof pine pillars so the pine trees are sort of the pillars of the house bamboo blinds so the bamboo tr- the um the bamboo stalks the bamboo trees are like the blinds between the pillars if only these could screen me from this world of sorrow so she's in the natural world she's sort of exposed to the elements and she is trying to see the civilized world in it but doesn't know if it will actually like stay that way so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I want want to leave you with is a very different take on the sort of fatalism, a less dire version of the the fatalism that we saw in the Heike Monogatari. And also at the same time, the way in which the, the writers of this period are attempting to reread the literature of the past. They're trying to reinterpret it and to make it new in Teika's sense or in Nijo's sense, I mean, also making it new, but at the same time, that newness is a means to sort of go back and look at that original text and reinterpret it in the light of a world that has been fundamentally transformed. And so that's all for this week. Um, I hope you guys uh, stay safe, um, stay healthy, especially given, you know, the pandemic. Um, If you have any questions, feel free to email me and I will see you all next week.